with now over 50% online shoppers starting their product searches on Amazon, you begin to really see the inverse happening as well. Someone finding a product and then wanting to validate or verify, hey, is this a legitimate company, will then go to the website of the company. This is the e-commerce brain trust, a podcast about building momentum online for established consumer brands. Join our hosts and their expert guests for high level conversations about e-commerce strategies, trends, and innovations. Access our brain trust and boost your brand's e-commerce potential. So welcome back to the e-commerce brain trust podcast and I'm super happy to finally have Julie Spear back with me riding shotgun <laughs> after a couple of weeks on vacation. Welcome back Julie. Thank you. The dynamic duo returns here, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's good. It's always yeah, it's good co-hosting with someone else you always get to bounce observations off of each other and and have a deeper conversation. So I'm really happy to have you back. Happy to be back. So today uh, we're running an interview that I did with Tim Curtis, who's the president of Cohere One. And Cohere One is a a great partner of Bobsled Marketing. What they do is integrated marketing. And I, I got the full explanation of that from Tim when I talked with him. But essentially the the execution as well as developing a strategy roadmap for multi-channel marketing specifically for retailers and brands. What that means in a real world context is all the different marketing channels that a retailer may have, whether that's print, which we talk a lot about today, print and catalogs, in-store, e-commerce, even marketplaces, and really a full service sort of execution and strategic consulting company. So we became pretty closely engaged with Cohere One as a company back in May when Julie and I attended their conference, the Cohere One Summit, and we did a workshop about Amazon, their audience there. And it was a real eye-opening experience seeing a completely different side of retail on the on the print side specifically when we were at the conference because Julie, you, your head and my head is pretty firmly in the Amazon game these days. So it was good to get out of our little Amazon bubble and talk with people who are doing things completely differently. Yeah, I like opportunities like that. It got my wheels turning for Amazon presence as well. So I think it's always good to get out of the bubble a little bit and stretch yourself. So we're going to run this interview with Tim and myself, and then Julie and I are going to come back after the interview and do a little recap of what I talked about with Tim, what that means for specifically for brands that have a online strategy and some observations that we have about print media as consumers too. So let's chat with Tim. So I'm here today with Tim Curtis from Cohere One. Welcome to the program, Tim. Thank you. Good to be here. So Tim, just before we jump into talking about the catalog industry and how that's evolved during your time in it, could you give the listeners a little bit of your professional background and how you came to arrive at Cohere One? Yeah. So my professional background is consistently varied. I got my start actually working in international marketing. And it was in a direct-to-consumer and a B2B role. So I actually had a foot in both worlds. And it was full-on international integrated marketing. So there were digital components as well as what we would call traditional print or direct mail, direct-to-consumer. So large database volumes. I, you know, I, I really got a chance to get acclimated to the business at a very early age. My career progression resulted in additional responsibilities, primarily on the digital side. And so I had an opportunity really to begin to take over more aspects of what it meant to create a full strategic plan. Most recently, from stints on you know executive management client side, and most recently was on the software side as a strategist, a digital strategist, before being recruited to come to Cohere One as president. And in that element, it was really the opportunity to marry both the digital and the direct, the offline, the online and the offline worlds. 
which is, is that what you mean now. by integrated marketing? Because that that yes. term confused me. Okay. Yeah. So integrated marketing, you're seeing a little bit of a resurgence in in the use of that word. Years ago, it used to be called multi-channel marketing, and we're now seeing more of the term integrated which really is more than just layering different channels on top of one another. It's really taking the digital and the offline components, such as catalog, direct mail, sometimes brick and mortar, and fusing them into a tightly integrated strategy that plays upon the strengths of each channel. And certainly Mm -hmm. in today's world, you look at the marketplaces such as Amazon, and that certainly figures into what we would classify now as an integrated strategy. Right. Got it. Okay. That, that's some really great background. And so just and we'll, we'll get into it a little bit later, but just in a sentence or two, what Cohere One does with integrated marketing. Yeah, so Cohere One is really primarily focused on developing strategic roadmaps to boost profitability. We do that both through an execution element where we take those plans and execute them as well as looking at that roadmap to integrate, you know, the catalogs and the direct mail with traditional digital media. And Mm. that's sort of the approach that that we take very heavily rooted, of course, in analytics. Got it. Yeah. And so how we came to know each other is through a partnership that Bobsled has with Cohere One. And I attended the Cohere One summit earlier this year or may it was may Mm -hmm. yeah and we did a a workshop on amazon for your attendees there and there was a lot of people from the catalog industry from the catalog space and it was a real i've talked about on this show before a real eye-opening experience for me because i've had personally so little to do with that whole world and really learning about how catalogs are very much alive and very much a actually an emerging channel for millennials for example Mm -hmm. so i'd love to hear from your perspective having been in the industry for for a while now a kind of a history of what it looked like when you first got involved and how it's evolved over the last five to ten years Yeah, so I got involved in the industry prior to the Great Recession, uh, prior to the 2008-2009 crash. And so I had a good number of years working in the industry ahead of that. And we were clearly the direct marketing industry, catalog and direct mail, played a very, very large role in that period of time. It was volume, heavy volume. There was multiple touch points. It was all about, you know, how often you could get in the mail, how often you could get mm. your clients to, you know, to respond. Size of your list. Size of list. Yeah. All yeah. of the traditional metrics that we looked at at the time, you know, size of list, you know, heavily leveraging email, heavily leveraging paid search and, and pay-per-click and, and, you know, kind of emerging really mediums. It really was at the advent prior to social media. So it it looked and felt differently. The pay-per-click space was really heavily dominated by Bing and Google at the time that you did not have Facebook coming in to, to the mix. And so but all of that changed dramatically in 2008, 2009 when the market crashed. That market crash gave everyone who was working not only in direct marketing, but in marketing in general, gave each of us a keen awareness of the diminished margins for error that we were truly operating with. And as a result, because of the crash, the the amount of you know decimation to marketing budgets that occurred really started drawing back. And so catalog and direct mm-hmm. mail being a very expensive medium was hit pretty heavily during those years. So you would see circulation or the quantities in the mail dropping uh, upwards of 50% in some cases. Mm. And of course, there were companies that didn't make it uh, Mm -hmm. through those periods as well. But the result of that, of course, is that we came out of that stronger. We came out of that with an appreciation, at least I hope we came out of that with an appreciation for the role that offline plays and the role that it plays in particular with online. And the importance of finding balance between your expenditures offline and your expenditures online and seamlessly connecting them to make a really thoughtful, cohesive map, if you will, of touch points for customers. And technological innovations, of course, you know, the rise and maturation of social media, all of those have played huge roles here 
in the last 10 years in getting catalog and direct mail in particular to experience the large resurgence that it currently is. These are good days uh, if you are working in the catalog or direct mail industry, for sure. What's driving that? Is it a demographic change? Is it the fact that people are getting generally less mail than they were before? And so when you get a a really good piece of direct mail, it's exciting and fresh. (laughs) Yeah. Well, isn't that interesting? It's a bit anachronistic to say that, yes, there is an excitement that comes with receiving high quality pieces. The inbox is not as cluttered as it was back 10 years ago following the crash. So there, there is a little bit of an open game, although I would say that direct mail is no longer a secret. Catalog is no longer a secret. So you do have a, a, quite a few brands getting into that mix. Mm. Another element that I think is really important and that we should not undervalue is the role that technology has played. Technological innovation allows now for the delivery of one-to-one content, even in a print context. Mm. So you have the ability to deliver all of the highly relevant highly engaging communications, but you have the ability to do it in a way that is very disruptive, very visually oriented, and really maximizes the benefits of print as a selling mechanism. And Mm. that is probably the single biggest element that I see in terms of what we can do. The the ROI numbers are, are quite impressive. That's a great point. And we had Larry Kavanaugh from Navistone on the Mm -hmm. podcast. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll link up to that in the show notes because that was a great episode about how his company, Navistone, is basically able to take website visitors and create custom direct mail pieces for each visitor that is able to take their online search habits into offline and and be, like you said, Tim, really disruptive to that experience. Yeah, and Navistone is a great example of one of the companies that we work with that we utilize their technology to build an overarching strategy and campaign for clients. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and you mentioned earlier millennials. Millennials and Gen Z are kind of one of the interesting stories, if you will, emerging from this growth of the offline world. They grew up not focused on paper. Yeah. You know, if you think about the educational classroom, they're growing up in an educational classroom where, in many cases, textbooks have been replaced by online learning. Yep. Now, there's all sorts of, you know, debate and now research is coming out from an educational context to say that's not the best learning environment for, you know, the haptics and the neuroscience of education. But the proof is that inside of that same demographic, those millennials and Gen Z, you're, you're seeing response rates inside those demographics upwards of 12% in some cases. So it really is quite surprising. And I don't think that's anything that was anticipated. If you if you had looked at that a few years ago, I don't think any one of us would have said that's a trend we see emerging. Right. Because kids are buried in their phones. <laughs> All the time. Yeah, my kids are. Yeah, exactly. Can you give us some examples? Because this is really interesting. I'd love to hear from you some brands and or retailers that are using catalogs successfully, whether they're targeting millennials or not. But yeah, just some success stories that you're aware of. Sure. Quite a few. And, you know, a couple that come to mind, uh, of course, is Patagonia. Patagonia is one that has championed the use of print for years. You know, Coher One has worked with Patagonia. And, you know, that's a story of how you can find the perfect marriage between the aspirational imagery of these images from the Andes kind of married up against product selection Mm -hmm. and the ability to kind of layer those two, the art and the science of marketing together into one piece that really makes it quite effective. Another brand that I'm really excited that we're working with is a brand called Steo. It is an outdoor apparel brand that is just growing tremendously, has an incredible mix of product and is in the same vein as a Patagonia in the sense that it has that aspirational, mm-hmm. that art married with the selling context. So you know, those are two brands for, as an example that are, are really moving the needle. You've got, obviously, we have a, a really fun brand I enjoy working with, Free People, which is a bohemian, mm-hmm. very chic women's apparel brand. And you know they have as well that marriage of art and science. And it's the combination of those two. And again, you're looking 
at brands that have really had a foothold in the the younger age demographic and the ability to sell into those demographics. But, you know, there's others. There's New Balance, there's outdoor retail, there's DHC Skincare, which is another one that we work with that has actually included in their catalog sends out samples and they have a very active integration with Amazon. So it Hmm. really begs the question, what's the driver and the catcher in these situations? But, you know, catalog in particular and direct mail has proven to be very instrumental in driving business. And, And I have a list of clients that we're not able to discuss simply mm. because and many of these brands you would immediately recognize but because they consider they consider the power of the catalog and direct mail to be so substantial a part of their company's growth that they don't want to talk about it mm-hmm. they're not willing to go on stage but trust me it's playing a a large role but it looks differently than what it would have looked like 10 to 20 years ago yeah really interesting The skincare company that you mentioned, DHC Skincare, can you tell us about what they're doing? Because you said the word samples and my ears picked up a little bit. (laughs) Yeah, so my wife is a a big fan of DHC as well. They have a a traditional catalog that you you would think of in terms of catalog, but they have instituted a part of the process, such as an offline, and then there is a manual component to this, but it includes like the glue dots and the inclusion of samples that go into the catalog. So you've got, you know, several samples at the front that are of some of the, you know, the featured products that they, you know, they want you to try and they make no bones about it. They have a direct consumer and then they have an Amazon store. Right. So they're driving traffic in both directions. And and some of that, you know, they, they will see come back in the form of shipments going out via the Amazon channel. Some of them are coming back to them direct to consumer. Yep. So it's a it's a part of their strategy, understanding that hey, listen, direct to consumer includes making a driving and a catching strategy. Yep. And Amazon can be a very effective catching strategy. Yep. Even Amazon is working on becoming a more qualified driver of their own success. So uh, I love that. that's an example of how. The complexities of today's business environment require really completely new thinking. Yes, such a great point. And one thing that I do want to raise here is there was some recent research. I wrote about it. I'll link up to it in the show notes about it was a survey and a behavioral study by Salesforce and publicist Sapient, which found that consumers are much more likely to want to place repeat purchases for products on marketplaces like Amazon as opposed to retailers. But they're more likely to discover those products to begin with from a retailer. So the question with the most relevance here is, imagine you want to buy something you've never bought before. Where are you most likely to go? For first-time purchases, going to a retailer, that's 50%. 50% of people are more likely to want to buy a product for the first time from a retailer versus 31% for marketplaces. But when it's a, if you want to imagine that you want to buy it again, where are you most likely to go? It's 47% for marketplaces and 34% for retailers. So in a replenishable or consumable category like skincare, like grocery, things like that. People are they're, they're discovering products through retail or direct mail, influencers, et cetera. And then when they want to buy it again, they're going to Amazon because they know what they want. They know what shade of uh, lipstick they want. They know what size jeans are from whichever brand that they want. And it's a much more seamless experience than going down to the store and picking it up again or trying to fit, trying to remember which Shopify site to go back to. Yeah. Or whether or not they have it in stock. And, you know, and that, yeah. that kind of also reinforces a couple things that, that we've seen just from not only some research, but some other presentations by other brands that, you know, when you're talking about Amazon, 10 to 20% of those that traffic that is driven to Amazon then becomes multi buyers on Amazon. In other words, to your point, Carrie, they are making those repeat purchasers. But an interesting fact, and this is one that's not often talked about, is we're beginning to see trends of such as three to five percent of that same traffic become brand customers. 
and begin shopping from the brand. Hmm. So when you really take that yin and yang approach to direct to consumer and the benefits of that, and particularly plugging with Amazon, it, it does beg the question, you know, long term, how does this play out? Because there's not only a potential to sell more units, but there's also the potential to be picking up more direct consumer, direct customers as a result. Yeah, that that's interesting because I think that a lot of brands, when they're first looking at Amazon, are considering it as a cannibalization opportunity when it's not. It's just people within different shopping contexts prefer different sales channels. And so if you don't have your your core assortment on Amazon, you're losing those sales to your competitors. If, if someone goes to Amazon and they're looking for this particular shade of lipstick, it's not available on Amazon. They're not usually going to go to any more effort than that and go to you know, an, another website or, or to the brand's website to buy it. They're going to be retargeted by a competitor or targeted by a competitor using sponsored product ads or, you know, really good SEO practices. And you're going to lose that sale to a competitor because you weren't available at that shopper's preferred place of purchase. Right. With now over 50% online shoppers starting their product searches on Amazon, yeah. you begin to really see the inverse happening as well. Someone finding a product and then wanting to validate or verify, hey, is this a legitimate company, mm -hmm. will then go to the website of the company yep. to verify, okay, look, this looks legit. Okay, this is, you know, they have, they have an actual address, those kind yeah. of things. So it's just a, a moving minefield, really, in terms of what's happening at any particular point in time. But we've, Kiri and you and I have talked about this before. It is not utilizing Amazon or pretending that Amazon does not exist that is the most critical error that brands can make. Mm. It's deciding how Amazon is going to be a part of the strategy and to what degree it will be yeah. or what degree it won't be. Yeah. And then making clearly delineated decisions based upon that. But mm -hmm. the rules are changing mm. and we have to get a new rule book. Mm. Yeah. While we're on the topic of Amazon, I want to, I want to shift gears back to direct mail again. But one example that I've personally seen of direct mail, primarily direct mail company using their Amazon presence as well is Pajamagram. And they have their mm -hmm. catalog. And in um, maybe it was 2016 now, they had a, a link to their Amazon branded store on the front of their catalog, on the, on the title page of their catalog. It said something like, visit us at amazon.com slash pajamagram. So they had a branded storefront. And that was, that to me was so, such a big message that a company like Pajamagram, highly seasonal, highly driven by direct mail, was encouraging their direct mail subscribers to visit their Amazon store. So that was a real vote of confidence to me that if they're making that move, that they're seeing value in in pushing people to Amazon, either because that's people's preferred way to shop and they have their credit card details saved there, or they have some kind of strategy to bring those customers back and retain them on their list, whatever it was. That was one of the first indications I really saw of that marriage between an Amazon marketplace strategy and direct mail. Yeah. The, the examples are becoming more prevalent as more and more companies engage and find and utilize the marketplaces as selling vehicles. Okay, so let's let's talk about a hypothetical situation where we have a student of the show listening to mm -hmm. this and, and they're a consumer product brand and they might be selling on Amazon to retailers or on their own e-commerce site and they're considering this direct mail opportunity. How would you encourage them to look at this and to start thinking about direct mail and potentially catalogs as well as part of their marketing mix? Well, the first thing I would argue or point out to anyone that is looking to incorporate catalog and direct mail into the mix is don't do it alone. It is a vocational specialty. There's all sorts of rules and regulations, and there's a lot of science. It's not only just the art, but there's also a tremendous amount of science that goes into the preparation and execution of successful direct mail and catalog mm. programs. And the biggest challenge, I think, that folks run into when they jump into this in the deep end of the pool, if you will, is that they're not really adequately prepared. They may grab 
you know, one of their designers, hey, can you put something together? And the understanding of the necessity of where the layout points are, how the products are laid out, the calls to action, the postal regulations, the sizing, those are really not considerations that have been fully baked in. And when you're talking about the cost of direct mail or catalog, which can be significant when you get a a large campaign up and running, doesn't it make sense to ensure that that investment is given the best possible chance for return? So I would just urge caution at going it alone. There's a lot of opportunity to get guidance. It does not have to cost much, but it can be tremendous savings. And then as we have seen with a large amount of growth from companies in the pure play realm Mm -hmm. that are now getting into catalog and direct mail, it is a whole new world for them. And it's, and there's an element of, we don't speak this language. So you do need a somewhat of a borrowing that metaphor, somewhat of an interpreter yep. to help get through, you know, this particular minefield, just as Kiri, just as you would not necessarily jump into the deep end of Amazon without having some type of consultation where you could really get yourself into trouble. So that would be probably the single best piece of advice I could give to any, any brand that is looking at the opportunity. Hashtag it's complicated. Hashtag it's complicated <laughs> for sure. Yeah, no question. <laughs> and so what kind I, of- I wish it were simple. <laughs> and so is there a sort of, I guess, a, an avatar client of someone who you think of, there's a high probability of being successful with a direct mail or catalog strategy versus a company that may be too early on or too limited? Like what, what is a good candidate and a poor candidate for direct mail when it comes to retail? Well, I think good candidates for direct mail opportunities kind of span the gamut. There, there really are a lot of ways you can win. So there's a, there's a lot of opportunity, whether you're talking about apparel, home decor, uh, obviously outdoor retail with some of the examples I've provided, lifestyle brands. But also specialty retail. So those, you know, mm. gardening, gardening's one, for example, that's been around and has been very successful. But, you know, any type of widget making has the potential to really incorporate direct mail successfully mm. into their plans. I would, I would say where I would urge caution yep. is brands that are really looking at little to no margin. Mm -hmm. They are looking at high volume turns where they need to make multiple multiple purchases, any of the staple type items. uh, That has traditionally not been the strongest selling suit in direct mail or catalog simply because the the turns are too quick. Barring a retailer like Target, for example. Well, and Target, so Target's an interesting example. Target has had strong success with leveraging print where where folks like Target and you know some of the other retailers have gotten into a little bit of trouble is the emphasis on in-store versus online and so they they run into stock situations so they've driven for example they've driven a lot of demand to a channel that they cannot fulfill those orders and so that that kind of sets itself up for mm not having the best success. And and there and I don't want to just necessarily pick on Target. There have been other examples of brands that have had very successful top of funnel demand driving activities, not just of course with catalog or direct mail, but with, you know, targeted paid search, non brand key terms, et cetera, that they have driven through the funnel only to have initial fill rate issues and not be able to fulfill the demand that they have generated. And that's always going to be a challenge, regardless of your marketing. Challenge. Right. Yeah. I can't wait for Julie to listen to this interview because you're, you're speaking her language right now around the in- inventory. Oh, good. good. <laughs> well, I, I consider that a compliment. <laughs> well, this has been really insightful, Tim, to hear your sort of your best practices here and, and what you see going on in the industry. So just to wrap up here, tell us, you mentioned a little bit about what Cohere One does, but if listeners to this show are interested in talking with Cohere One, what's the best way to get in touch with you and, and start that conversation? Yeah, well, I think the interesting element or the easiest element, I should say, for getting in contact would be obviously to go to the website. There's a, We have a contact us link or feel free to reach out directly to me on LinkedIn or any number of, you know, Twitter, any of those channels, but would love to hear from you. Would love to talk about what opportunities are facing your business and then really decide, you know, what opportunity is there? Are there, are there elements that could be quickly deployed even yet for holiday 
and turn that into a positive ROA. The holiday now? You're going out on a big limb here, I suspect. But- well, you know, we have, last year it was very interesting. In 2017, with the economy taking off as well as it did, we were shockingly busy hmm. towards the end of the year and we're putting in primarily direct mail campaigns that were getting up and running even just a few weeks before holidays. Wow. So yeah, it's uh, it's surprising. That is surprising. What planning can do, but you know, it never hurts to take a look and see what opportunities may may exist. You might have heard the CEO of Target this last week. He came out and indicated that this is perhaps the best economy he's ever seen yep. for the business. Mm-hmm. And I think what we're I think what we're seeing is that's going to translate into this holiday. Yep. And it will be really interesting to see how that all shakes out. But if we have a repeat or even an you know, improvement over the strong holiday 2017, it will be quite interesting. Yeah, I just saw yesterday the Consumer Confidence Index is at an 18-year high. 18-year high mm-hmm. since before the 2000. That's that's great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tim. And, and one more thing as well. If you're a, a retailer, that you have a great event that I mentioned earlier on the summit. So what type of, who are you bringing along to that event next year in in Philadelphia? We're still in planning mode for the summit, the 2019 summit. What I can tell you is that it's going to be obviously very heavily focused just as the 2017, or excuse me, 2018 was, but the 2019 summit is actually going to be in Philadelphia, in downtown Philadelphia. The dates are... April 24th to 25th, and it is going to be power packed. Yeah. Uh, we've got quite a, a nice lineup setting up. So a lot of details we worked out, but April 24th, 25th in Philadelphia. So Great. put it on the calendar because it, be, it will be a big event. Good stuff. Well, thanks again, Tim. Great to have you on the show. And and I'll link up to all those resources that you mentioned as well as the summit. And I'll catch you around very soon. All right. Thanks, Kiri. Well, that was a really interesting interview. Tim's really engaging guest to have on the podcast. Yeah, it was great. It's been a while since we caught up and, and it was good to chat with Tim. He has a lot of industry background. And then obviously, as president for Cohere One, he sees a lot of what they, a lot of the projects that they have going on, which he was able to talk about some of them that were really interesting, like DHC skincare and free people and Patagonia, but the experience runs really deep. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, he echoed a point that was that you hit upon in your conversation with Larry Kavanaugh earlier this summer, just talking about really how the advances in technology are allowing for even direct mail print content to have one-to-one connection with their audience. Yeah. Yeah. And really, it just underscores the whole like relevance across the board, whether it's your PPC on, on Amazon or your direct mail. Relevance is kind of the key to success. Yeah, definitely. And you and I were talking before we got on, before we started recording about what's been our, you know, favorite and least favorite direct mail experiences. And your least favorite direct mail experiences are the extremely unpersonalized ones. Yeah, unpersonalized and that lack any variety when it's it's going to be the same offer every yep. two weeks or months that they send the direct mail. I, mm-hmm. It's white noise. I don't pay attention to it as much. Right. You didn't get me last week. You're not going to get me this week. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You're telling me the same stuff over and over again. (laughs) What are your favorite direct mail pieces that you get catalogs? (laughs) I'm such the the suburban mom. (laughs) I love any that are related to kids stuff, (laughs) Mm -hmm. especially paying attention to them seasonally since I'm buying new clothes for them constantly, it seems. And my absolute favorite is Sur La Table. I love cooking. And Mm. They do a really good job. It's it's not a hefty piece of mail that they send. It's pretty slim, but it it pretty it varies pretty well every time I get it. Yeah. So it makes me think I, I'll be a better cook every time I look at it too. <laughs> hey, that's a great point because that's the real aspirational thing, and that's what Tim yeah. mentioned with Patagonia as well. It's aspirational, as pe- you know, even if you never you know get out of the house on the weekends, the idea of you being on the top of a mountain in Kathmandu 
is like people want to put themselves in that situation. They want to visualize that. They want to also visualize an incredible lasagna that they just served up on a perfectly placed table as well. Yeah. Well, when you, when you think <laughs> of it, a lot of it with the imagery, we talk yeah. about it with Amazon listings as well. The importance of the lifestyle imagery that brings yes. the product to life. And yep. it's the same in direct mail. When there's the one that I get every single time, it's the same coupon every time, and it's just showing the products. Mm-hmm. The different with the one that I love with Sir Latab is it's showing the lifestyle imagery. Like, yeah, I'm going to set my table like that and use my my scan pan to make a rockin' meal. <laughs> like, <laughs> the, the imagery makes a difference. And so whether it's direct mail or your Amazon listing, great imagery is key. Yeah, my favorite catalog of all time is Ikea. And I'm not sure you could call it Ikea, shopping at Ikea aspirational, but their styling of the rooms and the, and the fact that they give you all these ideas of how to style a small room. There's always tons about best practices with storage and stuff like that. It really, it's aspirational, not because of the the price point or who it's aimed at. It's aspirational because it's showing you, hey, even if you have a small apartment, you can have a really well-organized, functional, good-looking apartment. And so like 90% of the catalog is styled rooms. It's not the wardrobe on a white background. It's the wardrobe in the context of a small apartment and how someone has styled it. So and I think I, I mean, even amongst like public, I'm really into decor and decorating, obviously, even amongst like apartment therapy and some of these websites that curate home decor content, everyone gets excited about the IKEA catalog, no matter how high end a decorator you are, it's still a really, it's a publication that everyone looks forward to quarterly and it builds a lot of anticipation around it. So that's my, I think my all time favorite direct mail. Yeah. I've always liked that one too. And you're right. Aspirational, the price point, it's not aspirational in that way, but if it it is for maximizing space and for, you know, a minimalist style, like there's a lot that they capture and convey about their products through their catalog. And yeah, I've always been a fan of that one as well. Yeah. So back to your comment about merging content and selling essentially and how that relates to Amazon. This there are so many parallels here once you get into it. So we're always encouraging our clients to develop lifestyle imagery and include them on the product listing. And now big news, we have the ability to add videos to all product pages with enhanced brand content, which is super exciting because that completely changes the shopping experience. So we have more ability to add content to product pages than ever, but then also thinking about what does that unboxing experience look like when the customer orders the product? Are you including some packaging, some inserts along with that product to to show them how best to use the product, including recipes with food items, even including samples of other products in your that your brand produces along with the, the package. So once you start thinking about even just your e-commerce business from a direct mail standpoint, there's lots of things that you can be doing to increase the the aspirational nature of the product right up front as as well as when they actually receive the product in hand. You mentioned the samples. <laughs> I think anything that could build customer loyalty and future purchase, the addition of a sample is a good way to go right there. I know I'm yep. a, definitely a sucker for that. Yeah, well, entire businesses are built around samples like Ipsy and Birchbox and Birch you know, people, oh, people pay for samples. <laughs> yes, I'm one of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, this this is great. Any other parting words from you, Julie, about this conversation about direct mail? I, well, not directly about direct mail, not to be redundant with my word choice there, but I'm really excited for Q4 given the conversation that you guys had at the very end. Mm. Very excited to buckle up and also underscore the importance of inventory management. Yeah. (laughs) If you're going to market and advertise your product in any way, regardless if it's through direct mail or on Amazon, you got to make sure your your product is there. So thank you for giving an opportunity for me to share my standard PSA of inventory (laughs) management is important. (laughs) Yeah, I'm always looking out for you. 
Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) All right. Good stuff, Julie. Well, thanks for coming on again. Great to have you back and I'll catch you next week. Sounds great. Bye, Carrie. Bye-bye.